off immediately. Uh, this is the Patrick Netherton Show, 1130 The Tiger. He's Roger Sampton. I'm Patrick Netherton. Pleased to welcome in uh, a man I'm pleased to refer to as a friend, uh, one of the best in the business. He is the president of the University of Louisiana School System. He is Dr. Jim Henderson. Doc, how are you? Well, I'm, uh, I'm glad you're not calling me Shirley. I am not. I uh, do and, want to wish uh, you both good luck, and uh, we're all counting on you. <laughs> I love it. Uh, doing well, Patrick. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Uh, fam okay? Uh, kids? Uh, your, your, your wife that you definitely outkicked your coverage with? Everyone, <laughs> everyone good? Well, listen, so we, we locked down, I mean, very closely uh, here at home. Didn't even go out to, to, to supermarket stuff for two weeks for one reason. So that our quarantine grandbaby could make the trip from Dallas and spend the week with us before he gets baptized. So she, he is here, and she is on cloud nine. That's, I've never seen her this happy. So it's it's pretty cool. That's beautiful. I love it. Yeah. Hey, uh, you were on Tim Fletcher's show this morning. First time that Fletch and I have double booked a guest on the same day. Uh, so and what uh, what questions do you want to answer that that you didn't answer <laughs> this morning? Just no comparing of the facts. So just let's try to if we're going to ask similar questions let's make sure there's enough nuance to give me plausible deniability well look here's but, uh, the thing if you know me you know i'm i'm uh my my show is pretty goofy anyway so there's no telling what questions you might get asked today well i just will tell you what i saw something that you posted first that was the first place i saw it probably you weren't the first one to break the news but um i know where i'm gonna be uh on some date in the fall of 2022 mm-hmm. it's in independent stadium to see the demons and the Grandwood State Tigers play football. And what an incredible announcement that was. I can't wait for that game to come. There's a lot of stuff to happen between now and then, but uh, that's great for both schools. It's great for Shreveport. It's great for that stadium. Uh, it's uh, Can't wait for that matchup. You know, it's it's funny you say that because, look, there are – there are so many matchups within the state of Louisiana that are so, that would be so easy to do. Uh, you know, yeah. Tech and ULM, uh, yeah. ULL and Tech, Northwestern State and, and, and ULL and Tech and ULM. I mean, there's all of these great rivals that have, they've all kind of distanced themselves in some way. Uh, you know, Tech kind of thinks they're above everyone else in Conference USA. <laughs> ULM and ULL are kind of their ULL calls itself the University of Louisiana. Like there's all kind no, of no no of, no no they call themselves Louisiana but not University of that's, right that's I'll, I'll I'll put the hammer down on them. yeah well their their hats say UL on them by the way so I, I just there's <laughs> there's a lot of there's a lot of of trying to distance themselves within the various universities trying to distance themselves from each other and I and I I just don't understand why Jim I don't get it it it's yeah. they're all natural rivals even if you're not playing in the same conferences anymore even if your football teams are at technically different levels why aren't these teams all playing each other re, uh, re, you know, regularly so when you see uh, the the last three years our focus has been to create a a notion of system what it means for us uh, to all be part of of one system, recognizing that the, the differences, the distinctions between each of these universities, uh, their histories, their their uh, their alumni, their missions, uh, they're, they're really distinct entities, and then leveraging that towards some systemic outcomes. And so we've seen the fruits of that, especially when it comes to academics, when it comes to advocacy, uh, our, our, our policy work at the, at the legislature. Uh, the last piece to come together on that, and you would expect it because of the passion around it, is athletics, mm-hmm. right? Now, I will tell you that uh, in the last few weeks, because of this, this common uh, um, uh, uh, era of uncertainty around COVID-19, you know, I've seen athletic directors having conversations, deeper conversations than a, than a dare say they've had in a long, long time. Uh, and so I, I think you'll start to see some of that be the fruits of this collaborative approach. Uh, with, listen, without watering down the competition, I, you know, I want McNeese and Northwestern to be a bitterly fought battle on that football field, right? Mm-hmm. But all of the things that lead up to that moment of competition, there can be a lot more uh, uh, collaborative systemic work in that regard, and I think you'll start seeing some of that. Well, I'd like to. And also, you know, you're hearing, uh, Jim, in a lot of the contingency plans, uh, a lot of the longer trips are, are talking about maybe, hey, we're not going to take many trips. Our, our, our non-conference schedules might get a little bit more regional instead of going around the, the country because of the response to this. You know, might we see something like, why, might we see the response to the coronavirus 
actually push this into the forefront because instead of Northwestern State going to play BYU for a guarantee game in basketball, maybe they go up the road to Ruston instead. You know, I think so. I think you will see some of that. And then uh, because of uh, uh, the successes around it, I think it's one of those things that will come as a result of the circumstance that may stick around for a while because it makes a whole lot of sense even outside of the uh, the current environment. Talking to Dr. Jim Henderson, the president of the University of Louisiana School System. Okay, uh, I likened you yesterday when I was talking about kind of where you are. I likened you to the president of the United States, and the various presidents of each school are kind of like the governors. Is that accurate in terms of how this is going, where you can kind of help coordinate everything, but in the end, the individual presidents of the university have to do the policy that makes most sense for them? Yeah, so I think there's, I think there is some, there are some parallels there. The, the, the difference is the presidents actually report to me on a chain of command, which certainly doesn't happen uh, in, in state to, to federal government. There's a uh, that's governed by you know more the Tenth Amendment that, that clearly mm-hmm. distinguishes them. So you know I work for a 16 person board. They employ me, and they hire the presidents. But then the presidents report to me, and uh, and I report to the board. So there's a, there's a little bit of a, a, a distinction there. But otherwise. When you look at it in terms of saying, okay, here's here are decisions. These are policies. These are uh, areas of operation that that reside at the university, right? That are that are owned by that president, mm-hmm. and the president, in concert with his faculty needs or her faculty, need to make these kinds of decisions. I, operationally, that's how we approach the business, and and we're doing that now. For example, and this is a great kind of a model of that uh, in the response to COVID nineteen. There are systemic principles that that we put out. You know, of course, we developed them in collaboration, but we put them out and say, okay, all nine institutions are going to operate within this framework. Now, you have room within that framework to meet the specific needs of your institution. And 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 so when you take it outside of the COVID-19 uh, response and you apply it across uh, all aspects of the operation, that's how we approach it. I think it's a real healthy way to do it. You get some of the advantages of being systemic, but at the same time, you're delivering services as close to the student as possible, and that's where you really find success. You know, your your alma mater had a bit, of, I think, a bit of a leg up when all of this went down because NSU uh-huh. already had a very a very real online presence in terms of distance learning, uh, you know, virtual classrooms, all of that stuff. That was already a framework that was well established at NSU. Do you feel like that that you know there were uh, some, you know, how, how difficult, I guess, was it when some universities like, like Northwestern are where they are in terms of, of have the framework in place versus some other ones that maybe are more on campus oriented and they had to start putting in the framework to do all of this remote yeah. learning? So, yeah, uh, you, you nailed it on the head. And, and Northwestern, and, and under the leadership of Darlene Williams for, for many, many years, had the, uh, the, the te- technological backbone and the scale of it, right, the capacity to do a lot of this. But you've seen a lot of technology emerge into even traditional classroom setting. Uh, the, it, 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 the advent of hybrid classes that might meet one day a week and the rest is facilitated online, uh, just using in, instructional tech, utilizing instructional technology in the classroom. So, so you had a lot of kind of, 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 a, of a quasi-evolution to that occurring already. Uh, but in the, in the six days from the time we realized we were going to have to make this move till we made the move, it was a Herculean task mm-hmm. of faculty and staff from across the state, even at Northwestern, because you have certain classes and, and certain teaching approaches that really aren't well designed for online instruction. You have teaching styles and, 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 and curricula that aren't really made for online instruction. And to adapt them at, a, at, at, at the speed of business, at the speed of the, the, the circumstance required, uh, was quite an accomplishment. And, and I attribute all of that to the willingness of faculty and the commitment of faculty to the learning proposition. What they did is is one of those moments I'll carry with me for a long time. You know, I, I remember being at, uh, at Bossier Parish Community College uh, 11 years ago, right when we started the budget cuts uh, in Louisiana. I mm-hmm. walk in the door on July 1 to a university that already has a half million dollar structure, structural, or excuse me, a college that has a structural operating deficit. And then we take a massive budget cut on top of that. And the faculty senate president came and sat down, and we're talking through it, and I'm laying out all the facts to him. And he says, well, he goes, would it help if we all taught a class for free? And and I was floored by that. Mm-hmm. I said, 
really, this is the solution you're bringing to the table. He goes, well, he goes, I, I think we want to do something. We, we can't stop teaching students. And so they did that. Now, that was not a long-term workable solution at all. But in the short term, they were able to do that. But what it instilled in me was this determination to ensure that these faculty would be appreciated and honored for that work forever. I'll never forget that. And I thought I would never see anything close to that until I saw what the faculty did for COVID-19. And I'm, I'm so inspired by it. You mentioned the budget and uh, state legislature getting back into session. Uh, since you've jumped in as the president of the, of the UofL system, it is we've seen the, the, the sharp cuts that we've seen to higher ed kind of stop. They've kind of paused in the last couple of budget cycles. Well, now, uh, obviously, the, the coronavirus response, the, the unemployment that's being paid out, the uh, you know the insurance now you've got the the gas and oil and gas rates are incredibly incredibly low. Uh, we're seeing hits on all side in terms of revenue. Uh, tell me about how difficult this this next session might be in terms of trying to get uh, and, and keep as much money as you can within that higher ed budget. Well, I think I think the uncertainty is the most difficult mm-hmm. piece of it, right? So so you've got economists that are trying to predict what the revenue. Uh, a forecast will be uh, with some level of certainty. And it's hard to do that in normal terms when you've got regression analysis and you can make that forecast. We know it's going to be difficult. I've seen numbers that range anywhere from a half billion dollar shortfall to more than a billion dollars. And we know that the structure of, of the Louisiana budget uh, means that that acts falls in two primary areas, uh, higher education and health care. Mm-hmm. Now, we're in a different place than we were 10 years ago. So 10 years ago when the cuts started, uh, the state funded almost 75% of our operations, about 70%. Today, they fund less than 25% of our operations. Mm-hmm. So the impact of state budget cuts is significantly less than it has been. But at the same token, we're still lowly funded institutions. When you look at us on a per-student basis, the total revenues we have to operate our our, our universities on a per-student basis, a, 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 a unit of production, if you want to use a business term, we're the second lowest in the nation. Mm-hmm. So we're already under-resourced in a lot of ways. Uh, I think the value that we offer students is, is, is still remarkably high. Uh, but if we're going to be competitive long term, we've got to, to figure out what this budget picture looks like in the long term and make those investments that allow us to be competitive. Uh, in the short run, I think there's going to be a lot of uncertainty. I think there's going to be a lot of angst, and there could even be a little pain. Uh, in the long run, I think our message that has, has resonated these last few years about the investment in, in colleges and universities being an investment in the future of Louisiana, I think that's going to still win the day. Talking to Dr. Jim Henderson, president of the uh, ULS. All right, so you you know where you are, you're not only in, involved on in the academic side of things and obviously the business side of things, the athletic side of things, and, and now – everyone is, as you mentioned, the uncertainty that's that's ahead. How many, just ballpark for me, how many contingency plans have you seen? Because, again, you're, you're dipping in all areas, all facets of everything. How many contingency plans have just rolled across your desk at this point? Or your computer <laughs> yeah, while you're well, at your house? Yeah, so we've got, a, uh, we've got a number of scenarios that we kind of played out. Uh, uh, and and look, it, a lot of it is is so far out of our control, right? Yeah. The, 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 what's got to happen? What the game changers are going to be two things: one, an effective treatment that that mitigates the the impact of of the of the coronavirus, uh, COVID nineteen, uh, on on those that it infects. That's first. Second is a vaccine, mm-hmm. right? Those two things, and look, it's the science that comes from our universities and universities like ours that's going to develop that. That's that's something sometimes we overlook. That's the, that's the academic engine, the research engine that produces that. Short of that, we've got to create the safest possible environment. We've had the, the, the first most paramount uh, concern of ours is the health and safety of students, faculty, staff, and communities. Now, we cannot create pristine environments that guarantee safety for everyone. We don't, we don't create sterile environments. If you think about uh, uh, meningitis, that's, that's still a, uh, um, um, uh, a disease that's out there that has a tremendous impact on college students. Mm-hmm. Well, we inform them about how do you avoid that. Here are the ways that you can avoid it. Here are the, here are the signs, and, and this is the way we, we intervene when that, when that happens. 
we've got to be able to understand quickly when someone is infected by COVID-19, be able to take all the measures that, that have been recommended to us by the experts to safeguard them and those they've been around. Uh, we're going to have, uh, you know, the classrooms won't look the same this fall. Uh, when we have students on campus, you probably we will never see 300 students in a single classroom again. Mm-hmm. Uh, I doubt you'll see 100,000 students packed into a uh, into a football stadium, uh, not not in the near future. Uh, but 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 I think that's short term. I think starting in the spring, you'll see uh, uh, a little bit even more of a return to normalcy. And a year from now, after we've gotten ahead of this thing, and science is one, or nature has rendered the virus uh, less lethal. Uh, as it's done with so many other viruses, similar viruses before it, then that's when you'll start to see the normalcy return. Uh, I, 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 I'm optimistic about it, but but I understand there's going to be a lot of angst and, and, and probably a little bit of pain before then. Moving forward, once we get past all of this, whether that's a year or two years, whatever, down the road, do you see some of the things that, that happened within this response being things that that, oh, maybe someone didn't think about beforehand. This was a great new idea that came about because of this. How many of these things that you're doing now do you see maybe becoming part of the regular framework of, of the university system, whether it's the, the remote learning, whether it's you know smaller classrooms, all of that stuff. When you get on past everything and we're back to some sense of normalcy, how much of this stuff that that's, we've had to do because of the, the crisis response do you think might actually stick long term? I, th- I think there could be a lot of that, and and here's the here's the challenge though. You, you have to be careful in looking at, at these interventions that have been put in place that are working because of the circumstance, right? That doesn't necessarily mean that there'll be a best practice or they'll work in the broader circumstance when mm-hmm. we have a return to normalcy. But there are some things that we're learning about this, and, and part of it is just our ability to communicate, right? It, oh, you can't over communicate in in a situation like this. Uh, it means communicating with internal stakeholders, external stakeholders, and remember, you know, being a university president is 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 really one of the hardest jobs in in the United States because you've got to balance the needs of various constituent groups, and often those needs are in conflict with each other, mm-hmm. right? So you've got to figure out how to navigate that. I think any time that they go through a crisis like this, it allows them to hone those skills to an even uh, finer point. It allows. Um, uh, faculty to be a part of of, of solution providing, and 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 because out of necessity, and when you realize that hey, we got a lot of smart people in this system that have a lot of great ideas. Maybe I can figure out a way to utilize them when it's not a crisis situation, but just simply because we want to go from good to great. Uh, so I think there's going to be a lot of those um, uh, changes to our, our our organizational culture, if you will, that'll emerge from this. That'll be positives. I, I think. Uh, I think. Back porch offices probably need yeah. to, uh, you know, I'm just saying, especially in the fall or in the spring when the weather's really nice and you want to sit outside. I think more back porch offices, office time is the way to go, Jim. Just, just me personally. Right. I, man, I, could, I couldn't agree more with you, but listen, so remote learning, we've realized you can be productive mm-hmm. working remotely, right? And, and so maybe it doesn't make sense uh, for everyone to come in and punch a clock and sit behind a desk uh, eight hours a day. Because uh, I, I know there there have been moments where I have been hyper productive, uh, locked in the house, uh, uh, and 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 maybe it's because the distractions are different. Maybe it's because it's a change in environment. But we're starting to see there's new ways to utilize people. By the way, we've got uh, 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 staff people across the state that are right now they're reaching out to students. They're retention experts. They're recruiting experts. They never would have had that opportunity if not for this uh, concentrated effort uh, of that, that, that stemmed from the remote learning, if you will, eliminated a lot of distractions. So I think we're going to see some, some changes to the workplace. They were already on the way just simply because of advances in technology, right, that, that, that allowed us to, 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 to stop some of the mundane, repetitive tasks. We can replace those with machines and artificial intelligence. It's those human uh, uh, Task, those human capabilities that, mm-hmm. that are going to be the, the driver for the future. Well, my, my favorite meme from all of this is I think, if anything, this pandemic has taught us just how many meetings could indeed have been an email. <laughs> Listen, I, I tell you what, I, have, uh, I, am, I am a big fan of Zoom mm-hmm. uh, meetings because if you know how to look at the camera, you can multitask and no one has a clue what you're doing. When you yeah. try to do that in a meeting, you get scowls and people are scoffing at you. 
I've uh, I've mastered the, uh, the the zoom. In fact, I might even have a picture. I just hang in front of my my camera. And, uh, yeah, just it, it just change just, it every once in a while. Yeah, just have a do like they do on those heist movies where they replace the camera with looped footage of an empty hallway. Just uh, exactly. just, ha, just replace it with looped footage of you staring into the camera the whole time and nodding yeah. occasionally. You're, and you're, you're in. You're an innovator, man. Hey, you are an innovator. Look, I'm I'm not a I'm not a genius for nothing. I can tell you that. <laughs> uh, Doc, I, I, obviously great to chat with you. Please uh, give Tanya a hug, the kids, the grandbaby, all of that, uh, the dogs. Tell everyone we love them, and uh, y'all stay safe down there, man. Hey, Patrick, same to you, buddy. Thanks for thanks for the visit. Look forward to visiting with you very soon. All right, Jim Henderson, the president of the University of Louisiana School System.